Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is so delightful to see you all here this morning. Uh, I'm Gary Shiro, Executive Director, and along with my co-director and very soon to be successor, Tamra Dillon, Tammy Wave, hey, uh, we're delighted to welcome you here this morning. We think there couldn't be a better place to host a conversation about the arts and tourism and the creative economy. 20 years ago, when this project began, this entire block was abandoned, and most folks said no one would ever come down here to this part of town. And certainly at that time, no one even understood the impact of a creative economy or talked about that. Well, thanks to our robust and diverse programming and events like our Winter Walk, which if you were here last Saturday and saw the thousands of people filling all of Warren Street and the side streets, you would know just how wrong they were. We're thrilled that uh, because of events like that, the National Center for Arts Research ranked Hudson fifth among small American cities for arts vibrancy and specifically cited this project and our ability to leverage state grants to make the restoration of this glorious performance space possible. So it is indeed a great privilege to welcome you here to New York State's oldest surviving theater and a testament to what can happen when creative people come together. So a warm welcome to you, and now please welcome to the stage our friend and advocate, the CEO and president of Columbia Economic Development Corporation, Mike Tucker. Good morning and welcome. Columbia Economic Development Corporation is incredibly pleased and excited to present this Creative Economy Forum and to play a role in focusing awareness and generating momentum to grow and expand our creative economy as an integral part of our mission to promote economic prosperity, job growth, and enhance the quality of life for everyone here in Columbia County and throughout the capital region. On behalf of CEDC and our partners and stakeholders, I would like to thank all of you for joining us this morning. I would like to particularly thank our elected officials and the CEDC board members who are here this morning. And I would like to thank Mayor Tiffany Martin Hamilton for the free parking during the holiday season so that we all didn't have to step out with our quarters to uh, plug the meters. And we're honored to have with us a number of members of the Columbia County Board of Supervisors who provide support financially and uh, otherwise to CEDC, as well as Mayor-elect Rick Rector. So thank you all for joining us. We're fortunate to be here today at Hudson Hall, which has undergone millions of dollars of painstaking renovation including funding from Governor Cuomo's Regional Economic Development Council and generous private donors, restoring its past grandeur and reinvigorating its historic role here in New York's Hudson Valley. I think you will agree it looks absolutely fantastic and it is well positioned to reclaim its rightful role as a focal point of our community. I wanna thank Hudson Hall for hosting us here today especially Gary, Tambra Dillon, and Sage Carter. And I particularly want to thank Gary for his dedication and vision and his he could believe it could be done attitude that resulted in the restoration of this facility. <clears throat> Gary, you've made a significant contribution to the arts community, not only in Hudson, not only in our region, but throughout New York. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our distinguished panelists for sharing their uh, decades of experience and expertise with us today. They are leaders in the field. I will make brief introductions shortly, but I encourage you to read their bios in our program. An important component of today's event as well are our sponsors. I want to thank KeyBank, Kinderhook Bank, Love Apple Farm, Columbia Memorial Health, 
and Price Chopper. Your commitment to the community and your support of this event and other organizations and events throughout the year make our community a better place for all of us. Finally, thank you to the dedicated staff at Columbia Economic Development, especially Carol Wilbur and Brandon Dory and Kayla Dunce for making sure that all the logistics were taken care of today. And I want to thank Camp Hill Hudson, who uh, provided the catering for this morning's breakfast. We are in a perfect time and place to have a discussion about the creative economy and its role in economic and community development. Integrating arts and culture into economic strategy has become increasingly recognized as a crucial element of smart planning over the last decade. And here in Hudson, the work that has been done and the work that Gary referenced earlier is part and parcel of the governor's selection of Hudson as a downtown revitalization initiative city. The hard work and community support that has occurred here over the last 10 years was recognized in that designation. Strong activity in the creative economy makes the community a better place to live with a higher quality of life. Cultural assets attract and complement growth in other industries and bring visitors that spend money at local businesses. The creative economy is also a job creation engine with uniquely positive impacts across all segments. The capital region understands the importance of arts, culture, and tourism and to drive progress in the area, the Community Foundation of the Capital Region and the Center for Economic Growth in 2015 commissioned a regional creative economy study, the findings of which showed the depth and strength of creative workers, entrepreneurs, and professionals throughout the region. Particularly in Columbia County, there is an incredible density of creative talent, from the church organist to the video game designer and the many skill sets in between. The study found that there were only two other areas in the country, Brooklyn and Tahos, New Mexico, that had a higher concentration of creative workers than those here in this county. It's encouraging that the region is committed to working on building these incredible assets, and CEDC is equally committed to ensuring that Columbia County is at the forefront of these efforts. The presence of art, culture, and tourism can be felt by all who live, work, and visit. This event is not only about recognizing and focusing attention on the fact that the creative economy is a strategic advantage and discussing how positive it positively impacts the quality of life, but it's about recommitting, recommitting by all of us to continue to develop these assets, emphasizing arts, culture, and tourism as a major part of our economic and community development planning. So thank you very much again for being here. It's now my pleasure to briefly introduce our keynote speaker, moderator, and panelist. We're pleased to have as our keynote speaker, Sarah Caldron. She's the managing director of Arts Place America. Arts Place, Art Place America is a collaboration among a number of foundations, federal agencies, and financial institutions that work to position arts and culture as a core sector of comprehensive community planning and development. Our moderator this morning is Maureen Sager, the project director of the Upstate Alliance for a Creative Economy, an organization that organized from the long-term discussions among a broad spectrum of stakeholders that recognize the importance of creative enterprise to economic health. Maureen is also the executive director of the Spring, Se Spring Street Galleries in Saratoga. Our panelists, Melissa off Demar, Philip Morris, and George Wachtel. Melissa is co-founder of the Basilica Hudson. She is well known as a member of bass player of alternative rock bands in her early career. She's released two solo albums as an internationally acclaimed photographer, but most importantly, she and her husband, Tony Stone, in 2010 founded Basilica Hudson, a not-for-profit, not multidisciplinary arts center, fostering creation and production of arts and culture while fostering a community, sustainable community. 
Philip Morris is the CEO of Proctors, the Performing Arts Center of the Capital District located in Schenectady, and the Rep, the region's only professional producing theater located in downtown Albany. Under Philip's leadership, Proctors has raised and invested nearly $50 million to expand its stage, a flexible 430-seat theater, public space, conference facilities, and even a central heating plant, and has become the center of downtown Schenectady's revitalization. More importantly, Philip has contributed countless hours and his incredible energy to promoting regional collaboration and is a strong leader and advocate for the arts in its broadest definition throughout our region and our state. Our final panelist is George Wachtel, president of Audience Research and Analysis, which he formed in 1996. He was previously director of research for the League of American Theater and Producers, where he spearheaded economic impact research for the Broadway theater industry. George is a nationally recognized arts advocate as well as an accomplished speaker, guest lecturer, and contributor. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to introduce Sarah Keldron. Good morning. Can I get a response? I used to be a teacher. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you. OK. Sorry, I needed to make sure everybody was awake. I drew, drove up from um, New York City, and I'm not sure I'm quite awake, so thank you. Um, OK, let's get me off the screen. Here we go. OK. So I grew up um, understanding that place matters. Most weekends, we would travel with my dad to the Lower East Side of Manhattan. He would tell us stories about street vendors and gang fighting and stickball on the street. He would even tell us about the strawberries that were stored underneath his bed every night from my grandfather, the fruit vendor. And go into extreme detail about the nightmares he would have about the pits from the strawberries that were going to attack him in his dreams. We would follow every day in the, on the Lower East Side with a trip to Katz's Deli to smell the aromas and nourish our bellies. And each story added flourish and cemented my memories. Other weekends, we would travel to the South Bronx and listen to our Irish relatives playing the fiddle after church. Or, for more fun and excitement, we would go on a tour of the cold water flats that my mother lived in in Brooklyn when she was growing up. As a child of immigrants, it was easy for me to understand that places embody traditions and memories, and that they represent the economic, social, and cultural vitality of a neighborhood, and to understand the joys and the consequences of being born in a particular place. So fast forward many years, and I became the executive director of Casita Maria Center for Arts and Education in the South Bronx one block from where my Irish immigrant relatives grew up. The same place, but with a profoundly different recent history. I was forced to consider how to support this community and all aspects of it, from economic development to education to public safety to health and to immigration. I turned to the arts because that was something I knew. I had two degrees in arts and arts education and because people around the country had started creating community change by employing arts and cultural strategies. Now, as the Managing Director of Art Place America, I'm here to share how I've seen communities solve uh, community development challenges across the country and learn about the amazing work that you are doing here in Columbia County. Okay, let me start by telling you a little bit about Art Place, for those of you who don't know. In 2011, a group of presidents from some of the largest foundations in the country came together, and they thought, you know, what if the arts came to the table not leading with their deficits, which is often money, and with their handout, but what if we came to the table instead leading with our abundance, which are artists? 
right? Not every community has a waterfront or an anchor institution like a university or a hospital, but every community has artists. So they created Art Place, and to date, we have invested over $100 million in seven years with 285 creative, creative placemaking projects in 229 communities of all sizes. At Art Place, we believe that traditional community planning and development has not always led to community being as equitable, healthy, and sustainable as they could be. We believe that arts and culture has an exceptional role to play and to bring a new set of tools to this type of work. And that an opportunity exists to further integrate arts and culture with traditional community planning and development. And we refer to, refer to this intersection as creative placemaking. Our mission, as Mike mentioned, is to position arts and culture as a core sector of community planning and development to help strengthen the social, physical, and economic fabric of communities. Let's start with community planning and development. When we think about community planning and development at, at Art Place, we tend to think along the same vein as Jane Jacobs, the author and activist who often opposed uh, Robert Moses, who believes that the most important part of living in a community is the layered complexity and seeming chaos, and that these things are the key to urban renewal. She believed that it was important not to destroy the culture of a place, and replace it with order and efficiency, which is what many of the ur urban planners of her day were doing. We tend not to think so much in the vein of Richard Florida's 2002 book, The Rise of the Creative Class. And this book was very popular. It was circulated among mayors and city managers and urban planners and encouraged the conversation to settle into a discussion around talent attraction and how to get the creatives to move to one city over another. Well, this book did lead uh, municipal leaders to look at artists as assets for the first time. It did so by positioning them as others, right? They were not rooted in any community and instead were sort of this roving economic development group who stayed in place as long as there was um, fair trade coffee, no more than a bike share ride away from their live work loft, and who left after the luxury condos and wine bars moved in. I should say that uh, Richard Florida's newest book has sort of continued to evolve and expand his thinking, and then it focuses on af housing affordability, transportation equity, and living wages for all residents in a community. So now let's explore the creative side of our work. Um, in 2010, there was a release of this white paper written by Anne Markison and Anne Godwa for the National Endowment for the Arts. And this really coined the term creative placemaking. It wasn't that this wasn't happening for many, many years all across the country by, and the world by many artists. Um, but this sort of was the first um, branding of the word. And they define community plan, uh, creative placemaking as community planning and development projects that leverage arts and culture to create place-based change. So how do we think about artists at Art Place? Um, in 2005, a group of foundations came together and commissioned a study about arts in America. It found that 96% of Americans valued arts in their lives, yet only 27% valued the role of artists. As Mike Tucker said just a few minutes ago, artists are our church organists to our video game manufacturers. They are the people in our community that live, work, and play in the same way as everyone else. At the same time, not all artists want to do this sort of creative placemaking work, right? When we think about artists, we draw off of our colleagues at Arizona State University at the Center for Performance and Civic Practice who have tried to define different types of artists and, and who they are and what they do. Um, so they've broken it into sort of studio artists, civil, uh, civic practice artists, and social practice artists. And they think about the di differentiating these groups by figuring out, thinking about who decides in each artistic process or product, who executes, and what's at stake. So if you think about the studio artist, the studio artist might be the 
person that when everybody thinks about sort of an artist, they think about the painter who's in their studio with the door closed, not talking to anyone else, doing their work and coming out with a beautiful project, right? Um, in that case, right, the artist is deciding what they want to do. The artist is the one executing the project, and it's the artist's um, livelihood, income, ego that are at stake. In social practice work, the artist usually decides what they want to see happen, and they often do this, execute it with the community. And both the artist and the community have a stake in the, in the end result. And for civic practice, it's really about the community coming together with the artist. So but the community and the artist decide what's going to happen, they execute the project, and then they benefit from the project. And oftentimes it's the community benefiting even more than the artist. And it tends to be, although this isn't always true, that the social and civic practice artists participate more in creative placemaking work. So to organize our um, work at ArtPlace, we created the Community Development ma Matrix, which is nothing new, obviously, um, but people do tend to like it for some reason, I think just because it's a chart. Um, and so it's a matrix with the 10 sectors of, career plan of community planning and development. And today we're going to, I'll talk a little bit more and explore economic development. Um, with the idea that sort of the goal of economic development is to create to improve the economic well-being of a, of a place, usually a city, state, or a region, and that economic development often sits on the demand side of the labor market. So the Federal Bureau of Economic Analysis a few year, years ago calculated that arts and cultural production has a unique value add of $504 billion to GDP every year. So we know that arts and culture production does add to the economy. But the arts, we believe, can do more than that. Right? They can support equitable community development and ensure that any development has the community's voice at the table. And that community includes the artists who are citizens of that place. At Art Place, we boil down sort of the creative place making process into four questions. What is the geographic community? What is the desired community change? How will the arts help achieve that change? And how will you know that the change is happening? And today we'll talk about economic development as the desired community change in that process. So when I look at um, the field of creative place making and economic development, I see six things that arts and culture can do to further economic development goals. This list is not comprehensive. And as you'll see as I go through the examples, much of this work overlaps. But I'll use it as a guide as I provide some of the examples. Okay. The arts can support engaging local community members in community planning and development. So this photo represents an organization in Denver, Colorado called Warm Cookies of the Revolution. I did say warm cookies of the revolution. Um, and they're an amazing arts organization that in response to the planned expansion of the I-70 freeway in Denver, um, and with a substantial amount of funds being given to the community that was being disrupted, they decided to design and install a series of interactive Rube Goldberg-esque machines as the center of a participatory budgeting process. So these machines, which will be in public spaces and places, will be physical manifestations of the complicated interactions of the policies and players that work in the community, as well as fun and attention-grabbing invitations for residents to participate in deciding how the funding should be spent in their neighborhoods. For the record, at every meeting, Warm Cookies serves a lot of warm cookies to get people to show up and attend. Shocking no one, food does appear to work to get people to meetings. Um, another uh, person who we supported in the past, Amanda Lovely, is a wonderful artist at the, who is an artist in residence in the city of St. Paul, Minnesota. She also uses food to support community engagement. She retrofitted a city van 
to create pop-up meeting. From this van, she entices community members with specialty ice pops, asking them to fill out surveys and to creatively engage in the city's work. So supporting small businesses and entrepreneurs. So when we talk about the arts, we need to talk about it like mayors and city planners, at least at our place. Um, take foot traffic, right? Foot traffic is one of the most important for public safety and economic development and often a natural byproduct of the arts. An example that actually my colleague gave here a couple of years ago is you have an opera house. It has 300 people come in at 8 p.m. If you, if the production is good, people stay until 10, and leave together. That's great, but it's two hours of sort of foot traffic and engagement. If you have a mu museum, you have 500 people walk in and out over the course of a day. And if you add rehearsal space, you may have 50 people coming in and out every hour. So cluster together those or those three organizations, and you can possibly drive 8, 12, even 16 hours of foot traffic a day. So in Detroit, there was one particular, particular avenue struggling with empty spaces and lots of small businesses. The Detroit Economic Growth Association decided to pair up pop-up businesses with artists to activate vacant storefronts along Livernoy Avenue during the Detroit Design Festival as a way to generate foot traffic to support the small businesses. After acting as pop-ups, a number of these businesses have moved into the spaces with long-term leases. In addition, they launched a third Thursdays to attract people uh, every third Thursday of the month, and they created a guide to Detroit's retail evolution, a, source, a resource guide for someone starting a business, installing a public art project, becoming an entrepreneur, storing a building or promoting a neighborhood. It's really a one-stop shop for how-to information revitalizing Detroit's neighborhood business districts. Attract and retain non-arts related businesses and development. When the green light rail was planned in St. Paul, Minnesota, they needed to figure out a way to mitigate the disruption caused by the construction for the local non-arts businesses, many of which were restaurants. Irrigate, which is the project's name, became a collaboration between Springboard for the Arts, which is a large arts organization there, the City of St. Paul, and LISC to do just this. They brought together the local residents and business owners with artists to draw attention to impacted spaces. So the Vietnamese restaurant that had never had hosted a, a musician before started to have music three times a week. 600 artists collaborated at over 150 projects, and led, which led to 30 million positive media mentions along the corridor. There was increased foot traffic and media attention, which led to revenue growth. Many business owners continued to host the arts programming themselves after the project. So this allowed the community to retain its non-arts businesses while going through a transportation-based development. Oftentimes, as you can see even just from the, for those of you who know the Second Avenue subway in New York City, this construction like this can really lead to the closing down of small businesses. Okay. Um, revitalizing vacant or underutilized land, buildings, and infrastructure. So rural Southwest Virginia, which um, can, is anchored by Abingdon, Virginia, is a ge geographically large region with many isolated rural communities that have rich traditions of uh, artists and storytellers. So although jobs and industry, sorry, and household income have declined in this region, many communities have retained their own unique and vibrant, vibrant cultural identities. Abingdon's Barter Theater is partnering with nine of these communities that have identified their existing historic theaters as catalysts for reinvigorating their downtown. Spotlight Southwest Virginia, strengthening downtowns through a performing arts network is what it's called, is a creative industry cluster development which is utilizing capacity building, shared best practices, technical support, and a regional touring network for live performance to strengthen these theaters. So they're creating a booking plan that will allow the multiple theaters 
that typically do not share the same audience to book performances together in order to save money on booking fees. So an artist will charge less per, per theater for their booking fee because they're all in the same general region. They are creating the best practices manual that I mentioned, and they're utilizing these theaters now on Main Street, creating a key regional strategy and, some, and what some would call serial creative placemaking. Creating conditions for, cre for creating jobs. Arts, arts help drive more stable communities. Gallup polls recently decided to study what makes people put down their roots. The top three drivers of community attachment are social offerings, openness, and aesthetics. In other words, the arts. In addition, an anthropologist recently studied participation in informal arts like the local drum circle or pottery classes. They found that participating in the arts reinforces individual identity and forges group solidarity and social bonds that last well beyond the community theater production ends. As people use those relationships to navigate their relationship to the city for their lifetime. So artists can drive stable communities, places where outside investors want to be and workforce wants to relocate. They can create the conditions for creating jobs. So Whirligig. Did anyone here read about Whirligig in the New York Times? We've got a few. Okay, it's a great article, actually, about Whirligig in the New York Times, if you're enticed by, by my story first. So in Wilson, North Carolina, which has a population just under 50,000 people, and is about an hour's drive from Raleigh, we saw this wonderful Whirligig project happen. So Wilson, North Carolina, has been struggling economically since the exit of the tobacco and manufacturing industries leaving many of the uh, buildings and many of the factories vacant in their downtown. A retired mechanic named Wallace Simpson had been making connect kinetic sculptures known as whirligigs for many years. They were a unique asset of Wilson. And he left an incredible legacy of hundreds of whirligigs that are on display around the world. And many remained on his private property falling into disrepair when he passed away. So the city and its partners really did something amazing with this work. First, they saw, realized that they had a true asset and something special. Second, the city and the partners created a workforce development program by training out-of-work mechanics to become the conservators and caretakers of these works of public art. So they now have a new skill and a new income stream. Local businesses like DuPont and Bridgestone also came to the table. Third, they created a downtown park and public space to display the Whirligigs. Fourth, the park hosted the Whirligig Festival, which draws crowds of thousands to see the sculptures each year. As a result, the area around the park has attracted over $20 million in private investment, while the park is still under construction. Vacant spaces in historic downtown Wilson are being transformed into housing and businesses, and about $35 million in private real estate investment has come to the downtown since the Whirligig project launched in 2010. So the last one, generate tourism. So I know that Columbia County generates tourism. I have a house an hour south of here in Dutchess County, and when I invite people up for the weekend, they always ask, can we go to Time and Space Limited in Hudson and antiquing. Oh, and are you near Olana? So I get, no one wants to see anything in Dutchess, just Columbia. Um, yes, cheers. <laughs> um, the arts can support tourism, right, clearly. And in fact, sometimes they can be the tourism. The key is to consider how this happens, how the full-time residents benefit from this, and how they are part of the planning of this work. So in the South Bronx, when I got off the train every morning, I would see a group of Italian tourists taking pictures of graffiti. They were on a ghetto tour. Not a graffiti tour, a ghetto tour. They had been promised a tour of the mysterious and diverse borough of the Bronx. Um, 
anyway, eventually, the good thing is that eventually, with enough screaming from community members and with support of the politicians, the tour company stopped these tours. And it wasn't that we didn't love the Italian tourists, of course. So I would venture to say that that type of tourism isn't the kind of tourism that leads to healthy, sustainable, and equitable communities. So how can we do it well? So in Sauk County, Wisconsin, which has about 9,000 residents, there's a partnership between farmers, local businesses, the University of Wisconsin Extension Office, the Chamber, the Government, and Worm Farm, Inst Worm Farm Institute. Together, acknowledging their local assets, which included the agrarian landscape, the local artistic talent, and the interest from surrounding communities to connect to their food production, they created a 10-day, 50-mile self-guided tour. The Farm Art Detour Trail is punctuated with demonstrations, farmers markets, public art installations, roadside culture stands, pasture performances, and more. Within three years, this tour grew from 4,200 visitors to 15,000, stimulating demand for arts and local food and an increase in traffic and sales with people coming from over 50 miles away. The farm, de farm Art Detour Project was able to achieve its primary goal of increasing dialogue and cooperation among a wide range of partners. So it wasn't just about tourism, it was about the partnerships that were created in that community. The public and private sectors came together with the nonprofits, with the farmers, the artists, and the local government staff. And there were offshoots that were created including permanent public art, new farm B&Bs, and new city parks. So they were able to brand the entire county while creating local distinctions at the same time. So, I, that being said, I thank you for your time this morning, and I am now very excited to join the panel and more, learn more about what you are doing locally. Thank you.